Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta, for inviting me to do this webinar. The topic for today is lymph node workup for lymphoma with an emphasis on small mature B-cell lymphomas. My name is Dr. Pavita Kajar. I'm a general pathologist at Joseph Grant Hospital, Burlington, Ontario, in Canada. Lymph nodes, they are part of immune system and they are distributed throughout the body, approximately 600 lymph nodes in the body. Depending upon the location, they are either superficial or deep and normal size is up to 1.1 centimeter. And solar nodes mean they are fighting the disease. Mainly there are three main components, which is cortex, paracortex and medulla. This is a nice diagram of lymph node. Here you can see there is a nice capsule around the lymph node tissue. And then there are these follicles. Depending upon the antigenic stimulation, either they are primary follicles or secondary follicles. So these follicles, they are situated within the cortical tissue. And this one is secondary follicle. So here you can see there is a nice germinal center, which has mixture of centrocytes and centroblasts along with the follicular dendritic cells and tangible body macrophages. And also there are T cells, which are helper T cells and regulatory T cells. Around these germinal centers, there is a compact layer of mature B cells, which is mantle zone. And outside to that, there is less compact mature B cell zone, which is marginal zone. So then between the follicle, there is paracortical tissue, which predominantly is composed of T cells. And underneath there is medullary zone. So primary follicles, as I mentioned, they are without germinal centers. Secondary follicles, they have all these mixture of cells. Mental zone is tightly packed, small B cell, which is outside the primary follicles and around the germinal centers. And marginal zone, this is less packed, small B cells, and it has more monocytoid appearance. And they appear lighter zone on the outer side of mental zone. And they also contain mixture of post follicular memory B cells and naive B cells. Paracortical tissue is predominantly composed of mature T cells along with B immunoblast interdigitating dendritic cells, plasma cytoid dendritic cells, histiocytes, and high endothelial venules. In the medulla, there are medullary cords and mixture of small B and T cells, plasma cytoid lymphocytes, plasma blasts, and mature plasma cells. This is higher power view of lymph node again. Again, these are germinal centers. This is cortical tissue, paracortical tissue, and medullary sciences. And there's a nice capsule on the outside. For the normal phenotype, mainly there are B and T cells. So these are pan B cell markers, which has CD19, CD20, CD22, and CD79A. Within the germinal center B cells, they are positive for BCL6 and CD10. BCL2 is negative in reactive germinal center. And then B cells in the primary follicles and mental zone, they are positive for IgD, IgM, along with CD21 and CD23. And uh, once B cells, they are antigenically stimulated and those cells with the differentiation towards the plasma cells, they will express MUM1 and CD138. T cells, they express CD2, CD3, variable amount of CD4 and CD8. Follicular helper T cells, they express CD3, CD4, CD57, PD1. And T regulatory cells, they express CD4, CD25, and POX uh, P3. Premature B cells, they express TDT. And follicular dendritic cells, CD21 and CD23 is very helpful when we are looking at vague nodules. And to highlight the background dendritic network, we need these markers. And then we have more markers here. So when we are working up a lymph node for the lymphoma, we need to look at the clinical history, age of the patient, sign and symptoms, duration of sign and symptoms, and especially if there are any B symptoms, Duration of the lymphadenopathy, site of the lymphadenopathy, whether this lymphadenopathy is localized or generalized, 
whether they are superficial or deep lymph nodes, they are involved. Those lymph nodes, they are painful or not painful. Either they are mobile or fixed or matted. And uh, up to 11 millimeter, they are considered as within normal range. Exceptions are there. And as a general rule, anything up to two centimeter or more than two centimeter is considered as pathological. For the workup, we can have material by different methods. We can have material by fine needle aspiration. We can make touch preps. And for uh, this is the one of the preferred method, which is needle core biopsy, which can be done direct or under the imaging guidance. And most commonly used needle is 19 gauze or larger. And for the adequate tissue, we need to have at least three or four tissue cores, which are non-fragmented. And each core should have at least five to 10 millimeter in length and total of up to 15 to 30 millimeter non-fragmented, non-fragile and uh, non-crushed tissue is adequate for the lymphoma workup. We can also have a seasonal biopsy and in seasonal biopsies. All these methods, they have their pros and cons and needle core biopsy is one of the most preferred one. So lymphoma is basically diagnosed with the combination of all these various techniques. Morphology is the key point. And then we need different ancillary tests. So we need basic immunohistochemistry panel, which can be established uh, with either flow uh, cytometry or by immunohistochemistry on the cell block. And then we need further testing like PCR, TCR gene rearrangement, karyotype. And for studies, we need definitely for major translocations. And very rarely, we might also need electron microscopy, especially if we are looking for any longer hand cell histiocytosis. So for the lymphoma workup, we do lymphoma protocols. So depending on the material, what kind of material we have, one of the most important point is do not crush the tissue because nodal tissue is a very fragile tissue and any kind of pressure or any kind of uh, mishandling that can cause significant artifacts and then morphological details will not be possible. If nodal material is less than 1.0 centimeter, we can bisect the tissue. If more than that, we can do serial sectioning at two millimeter interval and especially perpendicular to the long axis of the lymph node. We can make touch preps. Those touch preps they can be fixed and cool or air dried. If there is a suspicion of infection, fresh tissue should be submitted in sterile container for cultures. Immunohistochemistry we can do by two methods, either by flow cytometry or immunohistochemistry on cell block. For the flow cytometry, we need fresh portion in RPMI. For the cytogenetics, we also need fresh tissue that goes in RPMI. And for the fixation, formula and fixation is most preferred one because majority of the ancillary tests, they can be done on the formula and fixed cell block. And avoid over fixation, more than 24 hour uh, fixation in formula or more than four hour of uh, fixation in zinc formula, it should be avoided. Rarely we might need a snap frozen tissue for the DNA and RNA extraction. So these tissue, they can be stored at minus 80 centigrade until needed. And if we need to have electron microscopy, we can submit tissue in brutality height. So if we don't have enough material to do all this, we should have at least this much material for flow cytometry, for morphology, we need formula fixed tissue. And PCR can be done on formula fixed tissue. Flow cytometry is one of the best rapid sensitive tool for lymphoma uh, diagnosis. So for that, we need fresh unfixed tissue. Sample should go in RPMI. Majority of the B cell lymphomas, they can be diagnosed with flow cytometry. And uh, flow cytometry is specific for CLL and hairy cell leukemia. All other B lymphomas, they come with as a reported report as B cell lymphoproliferative disorder, and then they need further diagnostic tool for the subcategory. Flow cytometry is not helpful in the Hodgkin lymphoma because diagnostic cells there are uh, CD 
15 and CD30 positive read Sternberg cells, which would not be picked up by the flow cytometry technique. So lymphoma classification is based on the WHO classification. So broad category, they are non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma. And then under the category of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, they are either B, T, or NK cell lymphomas. And then lymphoma, they are further categorized based upon the cell size, either they are small, intermediate, or large cell type. So this is algorithmic approach for the lymphoma workup. So first of all, what kind of material do we have? Do we have needle core biopsy or excisional material? Next question is whether that material is adequate or inadequate. And is there any background necrosis, fibrosis, granulomatosis? And main question is, what is the architecture of the node? So whether that node is aphased or non-aphased. And if it is aphased, then what kind of pattern is there? So are we looking at the follicular pattern, paracortical tissue uh, expansion, or sinusoidal? And are they forming the vague nodules, tight nodules, diffuse uh, infiltration, or sinusoidal uh, infiltration? So once there is a neoplastic tissue present, the next question is, is that lymphoma or non-lymphoma? And if it is lymphoma, whether that is non-Hodgkin lymphoma or Hodgkin lymphoma. And if it is non-Hodgkin lymphoma, then we are looking at the size of the cells. So whether they are immature looking or mature looking. And uh, next question is, is that proliferation is of small cells, intermediate cells, large cells, or do they have plastic morphology? So once we have a phased lymph node, next thing we are looking for the pattern of uh, distribution of the cells. So they are forming either nodules, diffuse infiltration or vague nodules. Look at the size of the cells. Look at the morphological characteristic of those cells. Look at the size, shape, chromatin pattern, nucleoli. Is there any background mitosis or apoptosis? Are there any necrosis or granulomas? And then we apply our immunophenotype, which can be done by immunohistochemistry on the cell block or by the flow cytometry. Majority of the lymphomas, they are diagnosed with the combination of these two. And clonality is established by the life chain restriction, which is by kappa and lambda. And approximately 80% from the lymphomas, they are B cell lymphomas. So once we are sure of small mature B cells, there are some diagnostic clues. So especially if small B cells, and if there is a complete peripheral lymphocytosis and cells, they are round, condensed with clumped chromatin without any prominent nuclei. And in the background, there are abundant smudge cells. So possibly we are looking at CLL. And if those cells, they are slightly angulated, they are a little bit more dark, but again, without any prominent nuclei. So possibly we are looking at mental cell lymphoma. But if they are more like a blast looking, so possibly this could be plastic mental cell lymphoma. If cells, they are a little bit enlarged, but with the monocytoid appearance. So that means they have a little bit more uh, clear cytoplasm. So possibly this could be a marginal zone lymphoma. If there is a clinical history of pancytopenia along with splenomegaly, and in the peripheral blood film cells, they have those cytoplasmic projections. So this could be hairy cell leukemia, or this could be splenic lymphoma with villous projections. If small cells, they have more like a plasma cytoid appearance, has more bluish cytoplasm, this possibly is LPL or plasma cell neoplasm. And if cells, they are clefted or cleaved, possibly we are looking at follicular lymphoma. So this is the basic IHC to start with. So for B cell lymphomas, Basic amino histochemistry that is composed of CD20, CD3, CD5, CD10, BCL2, BCL6, CD21, and CD3, and CD23 as well. So this is with or without cell surface markers, and this can be established with the combination of amino histochemistry and cell block, as well as with the help of flow cytometry. And then we need Chi67 for the proliferation rate. 
So this is the algorithmic approach for um, lymphoma workup. So for example, now we know we are looking at the small B cell lymphomas, and this is the basic panel we have. So exactly the same way we use CK20 and CK7 in carcinomas, we can here use CD5 and CD10 for a basic uh, uh, preliminary diagnosis. So for example, if cells, they are positive for CD5, but they are negative for CD10. So possibly we do, this could be CLL, SLL or mental cell leukemia, lymphoma. If cells, they are negative for CD5, but positive for CD10, this possibly is follicular lymphoma. If both are negative, then marginal zone lymphoma, LPL, and hairy cell leukemia is in the differential diagnosis. If both are positive, which is rarely seen in 1% of the B-cell lymphomas, so this could be follicular lymphoma, CLL slash SLL, and hairy cell leukemia. So BCL6, that will be positive in follicular lymphoma along with CD10 and BCL2, cyclin D1, majority of the mental cell lymphomas, and hairy cell leukemias, and see they are cyclin D1 positive. CD43 is usually negative in normal B cells and positive expression is indicating lymphoma. BCL2, that would be positive in almost all of the B cell lymphomas. MOM1 is majority of the marginal zone lymphoma. They are positive for MOM1. CD21 and CD23 and CD35, that helps to highlight the follicular dendritic cells. And uh, CD23 is virtually positive in all CLL and SLL. And uh, immunoglobulin D is mainly positive in mental cell, CLL, and SLL. And sometimes we also use an A1 in hairy cell leukemia, but hairy cell leukemia is best diagnosed by flow cytometry. So when we are interpreting immunohistochemistry for the lymphoma diagnosis, there are some cautions and caveats. So for example, in CLL, CD20 would be weak positive and sometimes it can be absent actually. And then obviously we need other B cell markers for the diagnosis of CLL. And CLL would be also negative after anti-CD20 treatment, anti-rituximab treatment. And few of the lymphomas, they are typically negative for CD20. Another problem with kappa lambda immunohistochemistry is background uh, non-specific uh, artifacts and staining, which could be very challenging to interpret. That's why flow cytometry is one of the sensitive and specific method uh, for the kappa and lambda interpretation. And very rarely B cells, they can be positive in T cell lymphomas. For example, B uh, PAX5, that can be positive in acute myeloid leukemia, some of the carcinomas. When there is a background necrosis, and uh, for the differential diagnosis, uh, if we are thinking of lymphoproliferative disorder, CD20 is considered as a very robust marker, which can actually stain even degenerated B cells. So then it's very helpful in there. Cyclin D1 is majority of the mental cell cases, they are positive, but it can also be seen in CLL and hairy cell leukemia, some of the plasma cell neoplasm, and very rarely in the splenic marginal gene and lymphoma. So this is one of the potential diagnostic pitfall. So all these markers, they are non-specific, uh, they are not linear specific, and it should never be isolated, uh, should never be interpreted in isolation. So a full panel should be used for the lymphoma diagnosis. So for the mature small B cell lymphomas, they have either peripheral component or without any peripheral component. So for example, with peripheral component, majority of the CLL, they would have absolute lymphocytosis. B cell monoclonal lymphocytosis, pro lymphocytic leukemia, they will have circulating uh, lymphocytes. Hairy cell leukemia, we also see in the blood film. And the hairy cell variant, uh, we can also see in the blood film. Some of the B cells, they have more of the lymphoplasmocytic differentiation than possibly they are marginal zone lymphoma, LPL. And maltomas, these are marginal zone lymphomas. 
extranodal mucosa associated lymphomas and then there are splenic marginal joint lymphoma some of the lymphomas splenic lymphoma they will have villous lymphocytes then the differential diagnosis is here is a leukemia then there is a pediatric nodal marginal joint lymphoma which is unusual variant of marginal joint lymphoma next category is follicular lymphoma which would be usual one in situ one and pediatric type for the mantle cell lymphoma again there are classical type in situ type non nodal type and aggressive variants so for the small mature b cells first of all we look at the size we look at the chromatin pattern we look at the shape of the cells whether they are round cleaved uh, cleaved cells angulated cell monocytoid cells we look for the nuclear line we look for the cytoplasmic projections we look for the paranuclear half we look at the amount of the cytoplasm color of the cytoplasm whether they are grayish or more bluish and we also look for the background clues for example in cll we are looking for the smart cells we are looking for the autoimmune hemolytic uh, picture and any plasma cytoid or plasma cell neoplasm we are looking at the dule formation and then based upon this we apply our basic immunohistochemistry so now a few of the most common lymphoma leukemias so cll is one of the most common intraland leukemia patients they are elderly patients they present with b symptoms lymphadenopathy and in the peripheral blood film they might first uh, present with autoimmune hemolytic anemia like picture so in the cbc there will be leukocytosis and there will be absolute lymphocytosis so for the absolute lymphocytosis these patient they would have more than 5000 with or without nodal involvement if they are less than 5000 then they are monoclonal b cell lymphocytosis that can have cll phenotype or non cll phenotype and if they are in the tissue then they are are known as small lymphocytic lymphoma and most commonly they involve the bone marrow and in the peripheral blood film they would have less than 5000 absolute lymphocytosis this is typical picture of small uh, mature lymphocytes you here you can see majority of the cells almost all of the cells they are round with the condensed nuclei clumped chromatin very tiny small inconspicuous nuclei so this is very nice clumped chromatin and we are not seeing any significant amount of cytoplasm few of the cells they have prominent nuclei here but in the background there is not much mitosis apoptosis any necrosis any granulomas uh, there is nothing in there so for cll approach first of all we look at the peripheral blood film count then we look for the absolute lymphocytosis in the blood film we look for the smart cells we also look for any autoimmune hemolytic anemia like picture so these small cells along with um, typical mature b cells which has the size of approximately 7.2 micron meter which is almost equivalent to mature red blood cell we are also looking for pro lymphocytes so these cells they are a little bit uh, bigger than mature lymphocytes so they are small to medium sized cells they have clumped chromatin and they would have larger central nucleus so in the typical cll pro lymphocytes they are less than 15% if they are more than 15% but less than 55 this is a typical cll if more than 55% this is now pll which is pro lymphocytic leukemia sometimes cll cells they have a typical morphology they look cleaved folded plasmacytic they look more of paraminoblast morphology this is feature of atypical cll and sometimes in the nodal tissue we have uh, confluent and very large proliferation centers and sometimes chi uh, 67 is more than 40% but this is not equivalent to restricted transformation that comes under the category of aggressive cll for the rector transformation we need to have confluent area of large cells so that mean now there is a transformation going on into diffuse large b cell lymphoma and very rarely cll can convert into hodgkin lymphoma this is bone marrow picture so here you can see there is aggregate of 
small b cells so again cells they are small they are round without any prominent nuclei without any significant amount of cytoplasm again in the background there is not much mitosis necrosis apoptosis granulomas or any other aggressive features we can see here so lymph node architecture again as uh, diffusely or uh, vaguely nodular faced by the mature lymphocytes there can be sometimes pseudo follicular uh, proliferation and that consisting of uh, aggregates of pro lymphocytes and paraminoblasts so in the lymph node we also need to look for the large atypical lymphoid cells this is the characteristic amino phenotype of cll and cd5 cd79a cd20 would be dim and in the background cd23 along with other uh, markers these are the prognostic marker we use in cll so for example cd38 jap70 cd49d these are associated with the worst prognosis and sometime mom expression that may also be associated with adverse prognostic factor next lymphoma is follicular lymphoma this is lymphoma of germinal center type cells so there is a mixture of centrocytes and centroblasts so again for the architecture they can have follicular pattern they can have follicular slash diffuse or diffuse pattern and grading is done based upon the number of centroblasts per hypar field so for the grade 1 centroblasts they are less than 5% grade 2 more than 6 up to 15 and anything more than 15 centroblasts they have 3a and 3b so 3a mean there are still some centrocytes left 3b they are now without centrocytes so for the pattern follicular pattern it can be follicular and diffuse or diffuse pattern and uh, grade 1 and 2 they would have chi67 less than 20% is more than 20% in grade 3 and it could have more than 50% in grade 3 so that mean there is a transformation going on into diffuse large b cell lymphoma so in that case we need to give the percentage of both components some of the low grade follicular lymphoma they can actually have more than 20% of chi67 this is the typical phenotype for follicular lymphoma bcl2 bcl6 along with cd10 and for the fish they would have bcl2 translocation and bcl6 rearrangement and this is translocation to 1418 and approximately 85% of the follicular lymphoma would have this translocation so again for the architecture all the follicles they would have almost similar size they will be non polarized they will be attenuated or absent mantle zone there will be lack of star sky appearance that mean tangible body macrophages they will be absent so depending upon the grade there will be mixture of centrocytes and centroblast and mitotic activity is again also based upon the grading for the bone marrow involvement there are paratrabecular aggregates so depending upon the extent of the involvement whether there will be focal involvement or extensive involvement and this is what exactly we are looking for in the bone marrow for follicular lymphoma paratrabecular aggregates this is a nice picture of follicular lymphoma so here you can see these are the aggregates of those follicles they almost have similar size and there is no tangible body macrophages so there is lack of uh, starry sky appearance and they look quite monotonous small mature b cells this is comparison of follicular lymphoma and reactive lymphoma so on the right hand side you can see this is capsule and underneath the capsule these are follicles these are secondary follicles they have well formed germinal centers and around those mantle and marginal zone this is paracortical tissue medullary sinus and this is typical of reactive lymphoma in comparison to this on the left hand side you can see these follicles they are tightly packed almost there's a little bit variation of size but mostly they are of same size and again there is lack of polarization no tangible body macrophages no starry sky appearance and the cells they are looking quite tightly packed small b cells 
And those tight follicles, they are now strong positive for CD20. This is another comparison of reactive follicle versus uh, follicle of uh, follicular lymphoma. So here you can see again, nice germinal center. There is no germinal center. There is a light and dark zone, light zone, dark zone. There's no such polarization here. And Chi-67 in reactive is high compared to Chi-67 in follicular lymphoma grade one. Here, this is less than 5% in uh, within the center of those follicles. Next one is here is a leukemia. So this is uh, leukemia of uh, median age, 55 year age. These cells, they are B cells and they have hair-like projection. That's why the name is hairy cell leukemia. Majority of the patients, they present with pancytopenia, monocytopenia, and they would have massive splenogaly. In the peripheral blood film, we are looking for hairy cells, but because there's pancytopenia, we might miss those uh, hairy cells. And the bone marrow, there's typical appearance of hairy cells as fried egg appearance. Flow cytometry is one of the most sensitive and most specific tool for the diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia. So these patients, they would have this typical expression of CD20, CD22, along with sulfurous light chain immunoglobulins, and CD11C, CD123, CD103, and CD24. Typical hairy cell leukemia, they are positive for BRAF, B600E, and approximately 10% of the hairy cell leukemia, they also co-express CD10. So in the variant, hairy cell leukemia variant, these patients, they'll have absolute lymphocytosis, but they will have less marked cytopenia. They still would have expression of CD11C and CD103, but variant patient, they would be negative for CD25, CD123, and CD200. So as I said, majority of the patient, they present with pancytopenia, but sometimes patient, they might have absolute lymphocytosis. For example, here you can see all these cells, they are large. They have slightly uh, irregular nuclei with little bit smaller nuclei here. But main important point here is this grayish, hairy kind of uh, cytoplasm. So all these cells, they are hairy cells. So this is around mature B cells for the comparison, and these are two neutrophils. In the bone marrow, we are looking for the fried egg appearance with B cell markers, and we can also use an axon E1, but again, it should be interpreted very carefully because sometimes an axon E1 that can be positive in T cells and myeloid cells. That is usually not done anymore. And these patients in the bone marrow, they will also have increased fibrosis. This is typical picture of fried egg appearance. You can see these clusters of cells, they have round nuclei, little bit uh, uh, smaller nuclei here. And these cells, they have abundant pale cytoplasm. So which is giving this fried egg appearance of the heavy cells. Next one is mental cell lymphoma. Again, this is a mature B cell lymphoma, which is aggressive lymphoma. Depending upon the size, they can have small to medium sized cells. And again, it could be classical one or pleomorphic variant. Median age is approximately 65 years of the age. And mental cell lymphoma, we can see in blood, bone marrow, liver, spleen, or it could involve external sites. Typically, they would have IGH, cyclin D1, and on immunohistochemistry, there will be overexpression of cyclin D1. And depending upon the origin, they can be pre-germinal center or post-germinal center. Pre-germinal center, they'll be SOX11 positive, unmutated one, and they will have more aggressive clinical course. Post-germinal center, they are SOX11 negative. They are hypermutated, but they are indolent one. So again, for the nodal morphology, they can be diffuse, they can nodular. They have mental joint proliferation. Cells, again, they can be small to medium size and uh, or they could be blastoid or pleomorphic size. And these cells compared to CLL small B lymphocytes, 
These cells, they are a little bit more irregular, angulated, and they will have, again, clamped chromatin and inconspicuous nucleoli. Typically, they express cyclin B1 and SOX11, along with other B cell markers. Very rarely, they can be actually negative for SOX11, CD5, as well as cyclin B1. This is typical picture of mental cell. It look exactly similar to CLL, but uh, these cells, they are a little bit bigger than those mature B cells, and they are a little bit angulated but obviously without any amino phenotype or flow cytometry, differential is not possible. So for the variant, because this is an aggressive lymphoma, they can also have blastoid, pleomorphic type of cells. So if they are blastoid, they resemble more like a lymphoplastic lymphoma. If they are pleomorphic, they resemble more like a DLBCL. And sometimes they are very small. They look exactly similar to CLL. Or they can have abundant pain cytoplasm. Now they look more like a marginal zone. And they can sometimes they even have um, lymphoplasmacytic differentiation. So again, with this kind of morphology, we need to have, absolutely need to have a amino phenotype and flow cytometry and other ancillary tests. So again, as I mentioned, diagnosis is mainly based upon the morphology, overexpression of cyclone D1, SOX11. Flow cytometry will tell us monoclonal B cell population. For the molecular, we would have translocation of 1114, that's IGH cyclone D1. Another category of small B cell lymphoma is marginal germ lymphoma, which is a post-germinal center B cell lymphoma. So these cells, they are a little bit bigger than mature lymphocytes. They have abundant cytoplasm. They look more like a monocytoid. And if this uh, lymphoma is involving the mucosa, so then it's a mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma, which is known as MALT. And if this is involving splenic zone, then this is a splenic marginal zone lymphoma. So again, for the pattern in the lymph node, they would have nodules. They can be diffuse pattern as well. These are monocytoid cells. They will have usual phenotype of uh, pan B cells. And these are negative for CD5, CD10, cyclin D1, and SOX11. So take home point for the lymphoma workup is we are working with the smaller biopsies now. So morphologically, all the small B cell lymphoma, they might look exactly the same. But there are some diagnostic clues in the background. And uh, based upon that, we can apply our basic amino phenotype. Flow cytometry is one of the best and sensitive method for the lymphoma diagnosis, especially for the uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, not helpful in the Hodgkin uh, lymphomas. And for the morphologically, we are looking at the small cells. We are looking at the pattern. We are looking at the sheets of large cells. And are we looking the uh, for the larger cells amongst small cells. And we also need to pay attention to the background, for example, necrosis, mitosis, apoptosis, and granulomas. And uh, for the lymphoma, there is a diagnosis only based upon the integration of multiple parameters. So that include morphology, flow cytometry, uh, cytogenetics, fish studies, PCR studies, and very rarely electron microscopy. So the classification of lymphoma is continuously evolving as new therapeutic or target therapies are becoming available. Thank you so much, Dr. Lemsi Gupta, for giving me this opportunity. If viewers have any questions, please leave them in the comment box and I will get back to you at the earliest possible. Thank you so much. Happy holidays and stay safe. Thank you.